All right, you guys, we are in the home stretch here on to lecture 12, part one over groundwater. And I am really excited to talk to you guys about this because this is my bread and butter. Um, a lot of people don't think about groundwater resources right away within the umbrella topic of geology, but this is where a lot of geologists are heading nowadays uh, with the continued decrease of our groundwater resources. Because as you'll learn uh, momentarily, Geology has everything to do with groundwater and how we can access it and how we can prevent it from being contaminated and how we can remediate it once it is contaminated. And what you see on this picture here on the first slide or title slide is actually what we call a flowing well uh, or a flushed well. So this is a well that's drilled um, probably into glacial sediment and uh, as part of the drilling process, they use a number of lubricants and some other things to, to ease the process. And so once they want to get things moving and, and get the sediment that they've loosened in that process of drilling out of the well so that you're just getting water up it, they'll do a flush, which is where they shoot a bunch of air down in the well and it shoots up in turn a bunch of water and all of the loose sediment that was uh, collected. So you all probably have a fairly decent idea about how important water is, especially just living your day-to-day -day life, drinking water, showering, cooking, cleaning, washing your car, everything beyond that. We need it to water our fields and our crops. Um, it's used in, in some way, shape, or form in every single industrial process. And we as humans are essentially just water balloons with pulses of electricity going through it. What can be easy to overlook is how lucky we, especially as Michiganders, are to have access to that quantity of water, the U.S. on whole. And a lot of people may think, well, the, the earth is mostly covered in water, so why is there any water scarcity issues? And well, that, that is partially true. Um, the surface of the earth is mostly covered in water, about 70% is covered in oceans. However, all of that salt water, we can't drink that without putting it through a desalinization process, and we'll touch more on that later in the lecture. We also can't use it to water our crops because it'll kill the crops, and we can't use it in industrial processes because the salt will cause abrasion and breakdown of machinery and other material. So to give you guys some proportions of what we're dealing with here, of all of the water on Earth, 96.5% is in the ocean. So 96.5% of all of our water is salt water. It's not usable without extensive processing, which can be some, uh, which most of the time is an impractical process for usage. About 1% is other saline waters, so brines and uh, areas where freshwater meets salt water, so there's a mix. And then 2.5% is fresh water. Now, of that 2.5%, 68.7% of that is locked up in glaciers and ice caps. We can't use that because unless we wanted to harvest it and then transport it and then melt it. However, there's a lot of logistical and cost uh, problems associated with that. And then once they melt, they melt into the ocean, which means they get mixed in with salt water and that becomes salt water. Now again, useless to us in terms of consumption. And then 30.1% of that 2.5% of the total water on Earth is groundwater. And then all of the water that we see, that the this, this nearly 17,000 or over 17,000 inland lakes in Michigan and the Great Lakes and every other surface water body on Earth, that's only 1.2% of the total water on Earth. We can break it up a little bit further uh, than that into specifically what's in lakes, rivers, the atmosphere, so on and so forth. But the important part here is that of all the water on Earth, at most, less than 1% of that is actually potentially useful to us in terms of consumption, drinking, using for agriculture, using for industry, other things like that. And as just stated before, uh, of that less than 1% usable water, potentially usable water, most of that's within groundwater. And groundwater is named appropriately. It's water that's in the ground, so it's uh, water that occupies pore space in sediment or rocks, or it could be fractures in rocks, somewhere under the ground surface. It's usually somewhere between 
oh, 30 and 200 feet deep, depending on where you are in the world. And you guys have probably heard uh, about groundwater before. One common misconception is that a lot of people think that groundwater is just like a underground lake that's constantly flowing, much like the rivers or lakes that you see on the surface. And that's not true unless you're talking about uh, a, a cave that's filled with water or something like that. Um, so to reiterate, this is in very small pore spaces. So the little spaces in between the grains of each individual sediment or sandstone or limestone or whatever the constituent is, all those tiny little spaces are filled with either air when it's above the water table or water below the water table. Generally, uh, this water is removed from those pore spaces by uh, wells, so we can drill wells and then pull up that water by pumping it, uh, and then it can be resupplied or refilled by the process of slow infiltration. So it rains and the water slowly moves down and penetrates deeper and deeper until it recharges that aquifer. Or in other words, reaches the water table, the point at which the sediment or substrate becomes saturated. The degree of pore space that's available to be filled by water is referred to as porosity. Well, it can be filled by any fluid, so oil and gas industry will, will talk, they care a lot about porosity as well, but instead of looking for the space filled by water, they're looking for the space filled by oil or natural gas. But same concept, we measure this as a percentage, so it's what, it's the total amount of empty space within sediment or rock. If we're talking about loose sand, which is a really common substrate for us in Michigan. Again, if you go out in your backyard and just start digging, you're probably going to get a mix of clay, uh, sand, and gravel if you dig down more than three or so, three to five feet through the topsoil there. So that's typically uh, around anywhere to 30 to 50 percent. Uh, for a compacted sandstone, like what you guys saw in your sedimentary rocks lab, those are around 10 to 20 percent porosity. And the other thing that we care about is called permeability. This is an, an adjacent idea to porosity, and this is a measure of how well connected those pores are. It's a measure of how well fluid can, or specifically water in this case, can pass through that body on whole. So to think about the, the difference between porosity and permeability here is porosity is the empty space, those are the holes. So think about um, you have a solid mass that there's two tunnels through, uh, an upper tunnel and a lower tunnel. The upper tunnel has a connection to the surface, but the upper tunnel and the lower tunnel are not connected to one another. So these two tunnels together have this porosity of this area that we're looking at. Say it's 50% porosity, so they're, they're quite wide tunnels in comparison to the, the whole area that we're looking at. But the permeability is how well connected they are. They don't have a connection to one another, so if we pour water down the connection from the surface to the top tunnel, then that permeability is 25% of the overall area. And if we were to make a connection between the two tunnels, then we would have slightly over 50% just because we're creating a little bit more porosity when we drill that connection between the two, but they're there are two things or two concepts that are intertwined, but they are different ideas or different measurements. The water table is another thing that you've probably heard in science class before and may have a loose understanding of, but perhaps not a detailed understanding. In simple terms, and as stated before, it's simply the point, the depth, at which you go from having dry soil or dry rock to saturated soil or saturated rock. Now this doesn't go forever in terms of depth. At some point you, you go through the dry at the top, eventually you hit the water table and it's wet. If you keep drilling through that or keep digging through that, eventually it'll become dry again when you reach the bottom of the aquifer. So the water table is really the, the depth at which uh, the ground becomes saturated, specifically at its shallowest point. If you have three saturated layers stacked on top of each other and separated by 
uh, and permeable layers, meaning water can't pass through it, uh, something like a granite or uh, a really thick layer of clay. While the two saturated layers below do have tops and bottoms to them, the water table is only the top of the uppermost, the shallowest saturated layer there. So this transition yields two different zones one being the unsaturated zone, so the dry part, which is above, and then the wet zone, or the wet area, which is referred to as the saturated zone, below. And they're separated by the water table. Sometimes we also like to call the saturated zone the phreatic zone, and the unsaturated zone the vedosa zone. I'm going to refer to them as saturated unsaturated, but I just want you guys to be aware of those terms. One other note is that this is not uh, an abrupt change. So there's an area where it, there's a transition in between the unsaturated and saturated zones where it goes from being completely dry to totally wet. It uh, goes from damp to kind of wet to, to totally wet at the saturated zone. So um, as you can expect, it's not an immediate change in saturation. And that transitional zone is called the capillary fringe. I also want to mention that the water table is a laterally continuous feature. So there can sometimes be what's referred to as a perched water table or perched aquifer. This is when we get a little pocket of water um, that's a bit higher than the rest of the main water table. So this can happen when we have a, a small pocket of an impermeable rock layer. In this case, what's being shown is clay and what looks like probably the rest being sand. So we call these clay lenses. This is common in areas where there's been glacial activity because the glaciers will melt and then dump out pockets of different sediment uh, depending on where they they melt out in uh, the low-lying area that they're stuck to at that point in time. And what this does is that because we have precipitation and water or rain coming down and then infiltrating, it's coming straight down, but then it's getting caught on this perched uh, area. It's being perched on this clay lens. So some of it will roll off and go down, eventually make its way down to the main water table, but we can occasionally get it where we have a perched water table. And while these are really near the surface, we can still sometimes drill a well and get water out of them, although with them being close to the surface, one, it's not going to hold as much water, and two, it's going to be more susceptible to changes, meaning they're, they're more likely to dry out if there is a drought. Because groundwater is moving through those tiny pore spaces that's dependent on the, the connectivity or permeability, uh, how well connected those pore spaces are, groundwater tends to move pretty slowly. Uh, this is on the order of a few centimeters per day, typically in, in unconsolidated sediments such as sand, clay, and gravel mixture. There are a few exceptions to this general speed. Um, one example being if we're in a cavernous limestone, meaning a limestone with a bunch of little caves in it, uh, then if those caves have connections, they're pretty wide gaps, meaning there's a pretty high porosity. And if they're connected, then you have a higher permeability. Those two things being higher in combination can lead to, in, in that particular case, movement of up to several kilometers per day. So this depends on, yes, the permeability and the porosity, but also the slope of the water table. Uh, the water table is featured in surface features. So anytime that you're looking at a lake or a river, what you're seeing is the emergence of the water table. Look in this figure here where you can see that the very top of the water table there is exactly where we see the river and it continues through on the other side, even in both of these diagrams. That's how we can know where the water table is without necessarily drilling down. Now, there is uh, some variation with that laterally. What we typically see is that the water table will loosely mimic the shape of the topography of the land. So we can see here that we have this decreasing slope heading towards the river. Same thing with the water table. It's a decreasing slope heading towards the, the water table, but it's not an exact reflection. You can see that this has a much steeper flow, uh, slope and then it changes degree of slope down to the river. Whether is this while it is decreasing is a much, uh, much more steady slope. It's much closer to being a linear slope. 
or a straight line. I mentioned aquifer a couple times already, but just to expand on that, an aquifer is really any part of the subsurface that is both saturated and water can move with relative ease through that. Now, we know that groundwater in best circumstances moves pretty slow anyways, a few centimeters per day. So when we say easily, we mean, uh, you know, at least a couple millimeters per day or per week. Because water actually needs space to occupy, this is pretty common to occur, or aquifers are common to, to occur in sandstones, uh, conglomerates, wall-jointed limestones, so that's, that's different from the pore space within sandstones and conglomerates because it's the joints that the water is moving through, these joints being evenly spaced parallel fractures in the rock. Sand and gravel, that's what most all of our wells in Michigan are into, and then highly fractured volcanic rock. So similar to jointing, except instead of being in, in parallel, evenly spaced fractures or cracks in the rock, it's, it's more randomized and they're all pointing in different directions, which can give you highly variable permeability. A couple minutes ago, I also mentioned if you have a bunch of aquifers stacked on top of each other, they're gonna be separated by layers of impermeable rock or sediment. Those impermeable layers are referred to as aquitards. They severely slow the flow of water in between them. So impermeable is means that it can't be penetrated by water, but um, in a lot of these cases, it might be just that a very, very small portion of water or the very, very slow speed of flow can go through these. Instead of centimeters per day, it's in, say, millimeters per year, or even slower. In Michigan, most of our aquitards, or the layers separating our aquifers, are usually clay, very thick layers of clay. Clay has the ability to stick to itself. All of those little clay molecules are actually little platy pieces, so they stack really nicely. That's why we like to use it for ceramics, is because they can, with a little bit of water, they can turn into these thick, blocky material that once saturated to a certain point, it's really hard to get more water into it. Um, if any of you guys have taken a ceramic class, if you're trying to wet your clay, if you're not just doing the very surface of it, if you're trying to make it uh, less hard on whole, you really gotta put some work into stirring that clay body up and, and mixing those constituents. If you just pour water onto some clay, it's just, they're gonna naturally separate out into two layers with water on top and the clay on the bottom. Again, that's specifically if the clay is already saturated to a certain point. If you pour water in directly into completely dry clay powder, then it's going to absorb that water quickly. One example of an area where they're dealing with fractured bedrock that they're getting their water from and where their aquifers are housed rather than like here in Michigan with our loose sediment is that of the Sierra Nevada mountains and foothills. All of that is granite, and it's fractured granite or jointed granite in some cases. So um, take a look at this diagram here. You can see all those lines that are representing different fractures where water can move through. Each and every intersection of those lines represents the, the connections that they have. So every point of intersection is a connection between those fracture seg segments. That's where water can really move from one area to another or change direction. Um, if we were to look at porosity of grains, really those intersections are all over the place and on a microscopic level, meaning the water can move a lot faster through loose sediment than it can anything else. So with these aquifers, it's really it can be di really difficult to get water out of them just because it's moving so slow naturally, which is one reason why a lot of places out west, for example, California, have a lot of uh, rules and regulations surrounding groundwater usage. Um, if you buy any product, uh, you know, from Lowe's or on Amazon or wherever, if they also sell that product in California, one, they're going to have warnings on there for, for a number of chemicals that are known to cause cancer and birth defects. So um, anytime that you buy something, it's usually going to have that California warning on it because they also want to sell that product in California. And it's easier to, to put it on everything than it is to just put the, the put it on the units they're selling in California. But if you buy something that's made uh, to assist in groundwater consumption or uh, municipal water consumption, like a new showerhead, it's going to have a, an extra stopper on it 
or additional piece within it that reduces the water flow or water pressure. That way you're using less water. There are two main types of aquifers, and the answer as to what they are is in the name. An unconfined aquifer is an aquifer that is not confined, meaning that there's, there's no impermeable layer on top of it. It's just loose sand or loose soil uh, on top of it. This is the aquifer that actually has the water table at its upper bound. There is nothing standing in the way between this aquifer and anything that's happening on the surface, be it precipitation, contamination, or otherwise. So because of that, these aquifers tend to be the ones that are most rapidly recharged, meaning that any water that's drawn out eventually will be replaced more quickly with these types of aquifers than it will with confined aquifers, just because there's less distance to travel and less barriers to get through. Confined aquifers are aquifers that are confined, meaning that there's something on top of them. There's something with a very low permeability or uh, that is impermeable on top of them. And the thing about, the other thing about confined aquifers is that all of that sediment or rock that's above it is adding confining pressure, meaning it's the weight sitting on top of it. So it has this pressure built up, which we call hydrostatic head. More on that momentarily. But in comparison to the unconfined aquifer, these are uh, recharged at a much slower rate because they're a further from the surface, so they're further from the option to be recharged, so infiltrating precipitation, and there's more barriers in between these and the, and the surface. So those, depending on how deep it is and how many confining layers are between that particular aquifer and the surface, it's going to take quite a while for it to become recharged or to have more water added to it, sometimes on the order of thousands of years or even tens of thousands of years. When we drill a well into an unconfined aquifer, um, the water level that we see in that well is just the water table. That's the, the depth of the water table because we're essentially just sticking a big giant metal straw through the earth's surface down into the, down into the water table. So if you want to get the water table depth, you find a well that goes to an unconfined aquifer, you stick your meter down there and it beeps once it hits the water and there's a tape measure on the on the rope that's connected to it. And then you know that direct that's a direct measurement of the depth of the water table. Now if you're putting that meter down uh, the well that goes into an unconfined aquifer, you also have to account for hydrostatic pressure. So imagine uh, this hydrostatic pressure is similar to poking a hole and putting a straw in that hole into a waterbed that a couple people are laying on. What's gonna happen at the hole? It's gonna shoot out water through that straw because there's internal pressure in that body from the weight of the overlying people. Same thing with the confined aquifer. So the water level in that well for that goes through the unconfined aquifer is actually going to be a bit higher than where that, that actual contact between the unsaturated and saturated zones are. So that again is a function of the hydrostatic pressure and this measurement is what we call head. If the hydrostatic pressure in a confined aquifer is high enough, um, then we'll end up with what's called an artesian well. And this is a well that flows on its own, meaning we don't have to pump the water up because there's so much pressure that it'll shoot the water up through the, through the well on its own. Now this is fairly uncommon, usually with the unconfined aquifers, there's just enough hydrostatic pressure to, to lift that level within our well a bit, higher than where it's actually at underground, rather than push it all the way up to the surface, because with these confined aquifers, we're usually drilling pretty deep anyway, so that's quite a ways away up. So in most cases, we're not dealing with an artesian well, but with a regular well. Uh, or a pumping well where we have to pump the water up. When we do that, regardless of what type of aquifer it is, we end up with this feature called a cone of depression. And this is because as we're sucking this water up, that water level is going to pull down. Uh, and this is going to be a radial measure from each side. So it has an effect that extends laterally to a certain degree. The more you pump, the further it stretches. 
and drawdown is the measure of change in water level due to pumping. So if this is this white line is where the water was previously at, and this is the water level now that we've been pumping, and we've been pumping at a steady rate for say at least 48 hours or so, we know that this measurement in feet is the amount of drawdown that we get from pumping at that rate. And then we can use that to back calculate the exact porosity and permeability of the substrate, which means that we can better predict where we want to put our next well, how much we can pump, how many people uh, this municipal well can provide water for, how many gallons per day we can, we can pump out for X industrial process, so on and so forth. That's why it's important to have that measurement. If we have enough pumping wells in an area, a condensed area and we have enough of these cones of depressions resulting from that pumping and we're pumping at a higher rate than that aquifer can recharge naturally, then we're going to end up with subsidence. You guys might recall our conversation about Houston uh, as to why it's below sea level. Now that's partially because sea level has risen, but the majority of why, the reason why Houston is below sea level is because of subsidence. Houston is highly populated and has required a lot of wells to provide the city with municipal water, industrial, agriculture, so on and so forth. And so subsidence is the actual lowering of the ground because you're sucking out all of that water that was originally pushing grains apart from one each other and providing internal structure and lift. Um, and now that space becomes empty and the grains settle into that empty space because there's just there's no pressure there from that water that was once in that porosity or in those pores. Once we pull it out, we can't push it back in. That's only a slow, natural process of recharge. And you might be thinking, well, what's the big deal that the, the level just drops a little bit if you're not on a coastal region? Um, well, if you're not in a coastal region, it doesn't matter as much because you're not worried about flooding, but you might be concerned about uh, the cracking of foundations, the, the destruction of roads, the breaking of pipelines as a result of this. It's all things that are associated with uh, movement in the subsurface. So this can lead to thousands, millions, even billions of dollars in damage and in infrastructure. This is one of my favorite photos of subsidence. It's kind of hard to see, but up here you have this little sign. This actually says 1925, and this sign here says 1955. And I'm pretty sure this photo with this man standing here was taken in, in about 1975. And so what these years, these signs that are, are these years that are on these signs are representing is the level that the ground was at at that point in time. And so this is a result of subsidence or groundwater withdrawal. So this is a, quite a bit of physical change that we humans can make in a relatively short period of time. Relatively short being on uh, the geologic scale. A hundred years is just a, less than a blink of an eye. Even though it might not be uh, a noticeable change that we can see without taking those measurements and looking back at the data in our lifetime. A spring is uh, an area where we have water flowing naturally all by itself directly out of the ground, whether that be the loose sediment or fractured rock, and then onto the ground surface. So that's actually groundwater, it, technically surface water as soon as it hits the surface, but the, sort, the direct source is groundwater, which is why it's so clear um, and relatively clean. Why so many people go to the store and, and get the gallons of spring water and bottles of spring water, um, whatever quantity. Groundwater contamination is primarily what I deal with at my other job. Um, and there can be an awful lot of different types of contamination out there. And, and pretty much everywhere you go, the groundwater is going to be contaminated to some degree uh, if it's shallow enough. So all of these contaminants result from surface processes. So um, common contaminants that we work with are pharmaceuticals. So whether that's waste not properly being disposed of in industrial uh, production of pharmaceuticals or literally just you taking it and then going to the bathroom and that being sent to a wastewater treatment facility. Um, we can't filter out anything from pharmaceuticals. 
say for example, uh, antidepressants. So once that goes through your body, it stays intact. It goes, makes it all the way to the wastewater treatment facility and they'll treat for a lot of things, mostly bacteria, um, but they can't pull out many of the pharmaceutical drugs. So that gets discharged to surface water, ends up in our rivers and stuff. And so um, we can actually determine the collective amount of people that are on antidepressants by taking measurements from surface water streams like rivers uh, near wastewater treatment facilities and we can see an increase in the amount of people that are on antidepressants in the last 50 years by the amount of antidepressant uh, chemicals that are present in our surface waters. Another super common type of contamination is from pesticides or herbicides. This is because we spray on our crops and then we water our crops or it rains and that storm water uh, either infiltrates into the ground directly, what's not absorbed by the plants, or it get, if there's enough water, it'll turn into stormwater runoff and that'll flow directly into surface water bodies like rivers and streams. Same thing with fertilizers or feedlots, so where you have a lot of uh, animal waste happening and anything that they're eating that also was produced with pesticides or herbicides. A lot of different types of minings, whether it be gold, silver, mercury, any other kind of heavy metal are going to have their own unique contaminations associated with them. Those are some of the more concerning ones because they're toxic and low concentrations. Uh, landfill pollutants, we send anything and everything to a lot of landfills, so landfill pollutants are often lengthy lists of a bunch of different types of pollutants. Then we can have bacteria, viruses, parasites, so on and so forth, a bunch of different acronyms from industrial processes, really common ones are PCBs and TCEs. These are things that come from uh, things like paper manufacturing. Oops. Uh, paper manufacturing, linen production, any kind of paints, uh, and quite a few other things. Acid mine drainage, radioactive waste, oil and gas, every, any and every gas station has some degree of contamination to the groundwater surrounding it. Every single one unless it's brand new because those tanks will degrade and, and leak over time. Anytime that you see a gas station, just know that there's contamination associated with it unless it was literally just built like in the last five years. So as you can imagine with so many different sources of pollutants and contamination, there uh, most water sources that are close to the surface are contaminated to some degree most everywhere in the world. But the good news is, is that we can treat for a lot of these on the back end. But some of them not so easy to treat for on the back end and usually those are the ones that are the most dangerous ones. So it's pretty easy for us to treat for things like bacteria or iron um, and calcium and things that really aren't that dangerous unless they're in really high quantities and that's rare to occur anyways. But Everything else, those fun acronyms and oil and gas and all these other additives and industrial products, very difficult to, to, to filter out on the back end. It can be expensive to do so. And so what we usually like to do is try and remediate it, meaning we're gonna try and clean up the source. And in any kind of cleanup situation, um, we are, never really able to or never really even trying to reach 100% clean because it's just not attainable. We're trying to just get it below acceptable concentration levels. Try and get it to a level where it's not dangerous to consume. So in a lot of ways what's been done can't be completely undone. It can just be controlled. There's a whole lot of different types of ways that we can clean up all of these whole lot of different types of uh, contaminants and each of them have a specific approach or categories of approaches but generally what's going to happen is that we'll have some point source meaning the landfill where the everything's being piled up into one place or something like a gasoline storage tank at that gas station that's that's the point source it's something that's it's where the source is coming from one point and we can pinpoint that location those are the easier ones usually to clean up because we can focus on where it's actually coming from. And when they spill out, what they form is called a plume. So all of these things, if the, the landfill is not properly lined, will leak into the groundwater table. It will first move down the unsaturated area. Once it's in the saturated area, it flows a little differently. 
it spreads out a little bit easier and then instead of just being under the influence of gravity moving downward it's now moving downward somewhat but mostly moving with the flow of groundwater so this is like a side profile if we were to look at it aerially we would see this where it's moving further and then eventually it spreads out so in part this can be good because the more it spreads out the more diluted it becomes which means the lesser concentration it is and the lesser the concentration generally the less dangerous um, but also with concentration levels there's an what's called an upper limit meaning anything above that amount is not good for you that's going to have a bad outcome which means we need to get it below that upper limit same thing with the gas storage tank example here um, with some products they will go through to the water table and then spread out some things aren't water soluble so they'll sit on top of the saturated zone and kind of glide across it in whatever direction is down slope other things will are heavier but also can pass through water so they'll sink down through the saturated zone until they hit another impermeable one and then flowed again down slope whatever which way spreading out a little bit so there's a lot of different components to be considered in the movement of contaminants. Number one, it depends on what the contaminant is. Number two, it depends on the permeability and por porosity of the subsurface. And number three, it depends on the degree of contamination. Meaning how much was spilled in the first place, is it still being spilled, and things like that. PFAS is the bulk of the contamination that my work is concerned with. This is an emerging contaminant, meaning that it's something that's relatively new in science that we're still learning a lot about, um, even though it's been something that's been out in our environment for several decades now. Uh, this is something that you've probably heard of in the news as of late. Uh, a lot of people are referring to it as the forever chemical because it's extremely difficult to break down and without additional influence or outside influence, it won't break down. Uh, PFAS stands for perfluorinated alkyl substances. This is a group of upwards of 10,000 different chemicals, uh, only at most 70 of which we can actually test for, and is also extremely common everywhere because it's not, uh, it's rarely ever a point source. So in some cases it can be a point source because it's a product of an industrial process, anything that is, um, water resistant or flame resistant is going to have PFAS in it. Um, so wherever they're making, say the, the they're using a flame retardant uh, PFAS on, say, clothes that they're trying to ship out. At that factory, we might find, you know, a higher PFAS amount. Um, one thing that's really common is to find a high degree of PFAS contamination around any airport because they use what's called a triple a foam uh, that's really successful in putting out fires but it does have a load of PFAS in it so pretty much every single airport has a pretty high degree of PFAS contamination but it's also in a, a ton of everyday products that we use PFAS is in makeup it's in sunscreen it's in moisturizer it's what keeps your Teflon pans non-stick it's in the the wax that's on your fast food wrappers it's in anything that you own that's oil resistant, heat resistant, stain resistant, water resistant. And the reason why it's so widely used is because it's extremely effective for its purpose. It was originally created by 3M, which is a company you've probably seen on the back of a piece of sandpaper. Or maybe on N95 masks if you've been buying those. And it's structured in such a way molecularly that it has a hydrophilic end and a hydrophobic end, meaning one end that likes water and one end that does not like water, which means that when they stack up in a layer, you end up with uh, a material or a coating on a material that is extremely resistant and also extremely stable against water, fire, oil, any of those things that was were just mentioned. Remediation often involves breaking down excuse me, dangerous chemicals into non-dangerous parts. So if we take it apart, we remove the structure, we remove the function, it's no longer dangerous. 
With PFAS, they're extremely stable products, which means that they're extremely difficult to break apart. Costing an awful lot of money, an awful lot of time, and it makes it hard overall to get uh, approval to make a difference with. Approval in terms of grant funding, although now that this is getting more traction, um, we're starting to get uh, a lot more money allocated specifically to dealing with this. Um, Michigan is the leading state in PFAS re uh, legislation, regulation, and research, so we're really leading the nation in this affair. Uh, right now it appears that Michigan has the highest PFAS contamination levels, but that's only because we're the only state really testing for it and really looking at it. Uh, as this continues to become more popularized and the concern grows, we will find that every state has this. Any state that has any kind of industrial processes or any of these products, which is every state, is going to have some PFAS contamination. If you want to learn more about uh, the Biden administration's recent PFAS policy, uh, my work, the Michigan Geological Survey, has recently made an outreach video on it, and I've posted that link on the bottom of this slide here. The other hard part in dealing with PFAS is not only that it exists everywhere and it's in a lot of products and in a number of industrial processes and used for a lot of reasons, so on and so forth, but it gets cycled in our environment because of this. So um, take a look at this diagram here. This is by the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality, the DEQ, now referred to as EGLE, the Department of Energy Great Lakes. Um, but what happens if we, is we have a plant or an industry that's producing PFAS and what they'll do is the water that they use in that, pr that process, they'll just discharge it to a local stream so we have a direct feed into our local streams. And as we'll see in the surface water uh, lecture to follow, some of the recharge comes from precipitation, but some of the recharge to our groundwater aquifers comes from surface water bodies. So generally not a good idea to be dumping waste in them. And so then what they do is they take their mandated, legally mandated waste that they have to pay to be taken care of by a place that will filter out the most concerning things is they'll take that and ship it to a wastewater treatment plant. The wastewater treatment plant will filter out for the things that they're designed to filter out. And then they'll send some of it to their municipal supply and they'll discharge the rest of that water to a surface water stream. And then any solids that they pull out They'll take and they'll send to farmland to use as biosolids or fertilizer on their crops. And so then these crops absorb the PFAS and then we eat the PFAS. Um, or, and then that other part of the solid waste that they can't turn into biosolids and send off will go to the landfill. And eventually it will rain. And even if the landfill is lined over time, it will leach into the subsurface and we'll get contamination to the groundwater, groundwater from the landfill. And then all of this can end up back in your homes through a number of products, through the food that you eat, through the water that you're drinking, so on and so forth. So it's this perpetual cycle that's been developing for several decades that we're now just really getting a better idea about. And you might be wondering at this point, what's the big hoopla about anyways? Why is this PFAS so dangerous anyhow? Um, and the reason being is that all of those other contaminants that we discussed previously, those are things that we're concerned about in concentration levels. Um, and the, constant, the concern is because it's a threat to human health and environment. And those concentration levels for those types of things we're concerned about in parts per million and parts per billion. PFAS is harmful to human health and environment in the low concentrations of parts per trillion. To give you a little reference, that ratio is equivalent to a single, single drop of water in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. At that point, if you have that much PFAS in your water, it is dangerous to you. It can cause cancer, it can cause thyroid disease, birth defects, genital mutilation, and a whole list of other things. Which is why Michigan is making such a big move on this and trying to get other states to get involved as well. I don't say this to scare anyone, but it's something that not a lot of people are aware of, and it's definitely something that you've been consuming. I could test all of your blood right now and guaranteed some level of PFAS would be present. Now, that doesn't mean you need to immediately be worried about adverse health effects, especially if you're young. These things generally take decades to develop. 
What you can do is get a solid water filter if you're on your own water well supply. If you're on municipal, it may be you're going to have less amounts, but depending on what city you're in, they may not filter out for it at all yet because it's an emerging contaminant. It's relatively new news. Kalamazoo does filter out for it, um, but many other surrounding cities do not. So the type of filter that you need to, to filter out PFAS is very specific. It's called a reverse osmosis filter. And essentially it's a, it's a, it's a microscopic membrane that will filter out everything. This is how you get purified water. Purified water, like spring water, what we talked about earlier, is something that you'll also see on bottles or jugs at the store. And it's a very specific term. It means that it's been stripped of everything. All that's left in there is water. Um, and generally other water, like spring water, will have a lot of other things in it, like minerals. And these are minerals that are essential to us as humans. So um, something else that a lot of people aren't aware of is that when you're drinking purified water, it actually dehydrates your body rather than hydrates it because that water has been stripped of all of its natural minerals and when you consume it, it will leach the minerals from your body into it and then you end up urinating it out. So when you drink purified water, it's pulling those minerals that you need from you, which is why you can end up feeling more dehydrated after consuming purified water, which is why you want to get spring water or if you're drinking purified water, like what you get from a reverse osmosis filter that will take care of the PFAS, you want to get a, a remineralizer. It's just something that puts the minerals that you need back in it. That way it's not dehydrating you. Now, drinking purified water, you know, a couple times isn't going to hurt you. It's if you're drinking nothing but purified water for a prolonged period of time that you'll start to see those dehydration effects. One big thing that I want you to take away from this is that groundwater is a limited resource. When we talk about limited resources, often what people list off is oil, gasoline, uh, perhaps natural gas, maybe some minerals like copper or other precious metals, things like that. But groundwater should really be high up on that list. And that's because as we saw proportionally, not a whole lot of it to go around. And then number two, the part that is there is pretty well contaminated. Um, Anything after the Industrial Revolution in the late 1800s, we've got a lot, number of industrial processes that are going to produce a lot of pollutants and contaminants in our water. And that's something that we've been working on really cleaning up in the last 40-ish uh, years after the instatement of the Clean Water Act. While we use water for a lot of things, probably the most important thing and the number one thing we should be concerned about is drinking water because we need that to survive. Um, well, it's nice to be able to shower with clean water. We could also shower in a river and probably be okay. Um, but we need clean water to drink. So the water that we do have available, that fresh water, the groundwater, it's used in a lot of different ways. And what we use for drinking is referred to as public supply and domestic supply. So this overall graph, it's not actually a geographic distribution, but this is just a proportion to show you what percentages of our groundwater withdrawals in the U.S. are used for what. So 12.1 and 1%, you know, about 13% is used for drinking water. And so the rest of it goes to industrial processes, agriculture, mining, livestock, irrigation's a huge chunk, so that's Part of, uh, excuse me, this was aquaculture. So irrigation is agriculture. That's what a good bulk of it is. And then thermoelectric power as well. Those are really our two main usages. As you can see now, the, as we continue this conversation, the percentage of the freshwater or groundwater uh, on earth on whole that's usable to us as drinking water keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And the more that we use, the less that's there and available to us. Now you guys know how I feel about infographics, so obviously I had to include one of those in here as well. And there's just a couple of specific numbers I want to point out on here. Number one, about 90% of the U.S. fresh water supply is groundwater. So most all, but that's not a surprise to us as of right now. And groundwater accounts for 20% of the total water usage in the U.S. 
meaning that's that's uh, a lot of those things that we talked about in the last slide and that the other portion comes from things that we can withdraw from the surface. Now in Michigan where we have more access to groundwater and fresh water, those figures are a little different. That's for the U.S. sample. In Michigan, we have about 6,000 legacy contamination sites. Legacy means from some point in the past, more than 50 years ago. So old paper mills, old landfills, other old industrial places, things like that. And ever increasing discovery of PFAS sites. The key word being, or key words being ever increasing. This is just gonna continue to increase as we continue to test because it is literally everywhere as explained earlier. We have about 130,000 failing septic systems. Septic systems are actually the number one cause of contamination. However, this is fairly local and is fairly uh, treated easily by wastewater treatment facilities. Of course, if you're getting contamination from your neighbor's septic tank and you're just pulling directly from your well water rather than getting it from a municipal supply that's directly treating for it, then that becomes a problem for you. Um, but it doesn't reach that far unless you have like a whole uh, housing development that's all on well water and septic tank. Then that's something that you need to worry about. But almost all septic tanks fail at some point in time because they get old and they're full of, well, literal feces. And they'll degrade and erode and eventually leak out at some point. And people, it tends to be the thing that they, they forget that they have to do maintenance on. And I also want to point out this large figure here, 45% of Michigan citizens are served by groundwater. Now, what they mean by that specifically is that 45% of Michigan Michiganders are on their own well water, meaning they have their own well that they use to get water from. They don't have a water bill. They just pump that water out and pay for the maintenance on the well, and then every 30-ish years get a new well put in. Just because the, not because the water is necessarily run out, but because the well deteriorates over time. The rest of us, it's not like we're not getting our drinking water from groundwater. It's just that it's coming from a municipal supply. But that municipal supply just has a much larger well dug to distribute out the water from. So we're all getting it from groundwater, just that that 45% has their own wells. In most states, not that many people have their own wells. It's not that common elsewhere. But our wells are cheaper and our groundwater is abundant in comparison to the rest of the states. Okay, so what do we do to resolve this mess anyways? Well, number one is try not to perpetuate the cycle. So reduce processes that both use and contaminate uh, a lot of fresh water, whether that's surface water or groundwater. And then try and clean up what mess is there, remediation. And then some people are really interested in the idea of desalinization. That's where we take ocean water and we pull the salt out and make it fresh water. Seems like a good solution on the surface, right? There's a whole lot of ocean water, so why don't we just take that, pull the salt out, bada bing, bada boom. Look at this nice figure. You can just, you just take the ocean water, you throw a little bit of sunshine on it, and you've got fresh drinking water. It's a little bit more complicated than that. Desalinization, desalinization requires a lot of input of energy, so that usually means burning of fossil fuels which has its own host of problems associated with it. This process also uh, can contaminate the environment if it's not, in, and groundwater resources, if it's not properly contained and regulated, which as we've seen from examples of many other industrial processes can be, re uh, can be pretty hard to do. And then that salt that they're pulling out has to go somewhere. So then we can use salt for a lot of different things, but that's going to affect the economy of the salt market, which is also detrimental to some businesses and people. But mainly the problem is, is that it uses a lot of energy and the processes to build these machines use a lot of fresh water and there can be some contamination associated with this process as well. And not to mention it costs a good chunk of change just to get going. The return's not very good. I just want to touch real quick on this week's assignment. What you're going to be doing is looking up your water quality. So what is in your water that you drink every day? And that's important. That's something that's important for you to know. So first of all, you need to determine whether or not you drink municipal water at home 
or you're on well water. If you don't know, ask whoever pays the water bill. If there's no water bill to pay, then that means that you have your own well or your own well water. Um, from there, you need to determine what if you have your own well or your parents have your own well, their own well. You need to, to determine what kind of filtration system is being used. Um, and then what kind of water you're dealing with in the first place. That one's a little bit more complicated because you have to contact your local county health department. Um, and if you're on city water, then you're on a municipal supply, which means that they put out a water quality report annually. To find that, you simply need to Google the name of your city followed by water quality report. Um, now that's something that I would encourage you to do. If you're on your own well water, it's a little bit more lengthy process, but for your assignment this week, um, you're all gonna be figuratively on municipal supply within Kalamazoo. So what you'll do is you'll look up the water quality report, answer the questions, and learn more about what you're consuming as someone who is on municipal water supply in Kalamazoo. So just to give us a nice segue into the second part of the lecture, groundwater and surface water are interconnected and they interact constantly. Um, anytime that we're seeing surface water, that's really the, the surfacing of the water table. So like that figure that we looked at earlier, wherever the water table is, is where that river or that lake is going to be. Um, when it dries up, then, and this one really shouldn't even have anything there, it's just to show you that there was a stream, um, but then the water table is going to be low, it's not connected with the land at the surface. There are two categories of streams, gaining streams and losing streams. So a gaining stream means that it's gaining water, which means it's being recharged from the groundwater or the saturated zone. Um, so here's the example here where we have water moving from the saturated zone into the river. And then we can have a losing stream, which is where water is being lost from the river. So water is moving from the river into the groundwater system, into the water table, and eventually it will completely dry up. Until it is recharged, there's some sort of massive precipitation event, a, ground, a, a large amount of runoff, and groundwater recharge. And streams and rivers are often the point of maximum recharge, just because that's already a low-lying point in elevation. That's why all of the water, precipitation, and runoff is heading towards that point. Um, but two, it's already partially saturated, so it's easier for... Uh, the water to move through those pore spaces into the water table. Okay, so that is it for part one of the lecture. I will see you guys in part two for surface water and further connections to groundwater.